Stanford University. Uh, my purpose here today is quite simple. Uh, I intend to deliver on my brief and to talk to you about how to give a lecture. Uh, this will be a very basic primer on an elemental subject, how to go about doing the kind of uh, teaching in the sort of format that most of us employ for an awful large part of our professional lives. Uh, I intend to uh, illustrate this uh, presentation lavishly with fragments from my own autobiography. And I will consider this presentation successful if in the end it serves not as a model to be slavishly copied, but as an inspiration to you on which you might improve. Now, all lecturing uh, involves a certain amount of ritual. It is a ritualistic occasion in part, no matter what we do to pretend otherwise. And therefore, I think it's proper to begin this presentation with a brief prayer. Uh, and the prayer that I have selected, in fact, uh, might be taken as the standard graduate student supplication, the prayer of every novice lecturer, and I will put it up on the screen. <laughs> now, this prayer, in fact, can be taken to do double duty, uh, not just as a necessary supplication to the Almighty, uh, but also as a mnemonic device. <laughs> so I want to take the, this prayer as the basis of my outline. And the first and most important thing uh, every lecturer needs to consider when confronting the dread prospect of having to stand up in front of an audience strange or familiar and deliver supposedly authoritative remarks is what is the occasion? Simple enough consideration, but it's a question you need to ask yourself. Is the lecture you're called upon to give on any particular occasion a part of a uh, series in a course? Is it one of 40 lectures that you're giving in an undergraduate survey course, for example? Is it a single lecture given as a guest speaker at another campus or in someone else's course? Uh, is it part of three lectures that you form a presentation on a sub part of the general topic in another course or just what have you? What might be the occasion for your remarks is the very first thing you need to consider. Uh, and as part of that, of course, you need also to consider who is your audience insofar as you can puzzle it out. Sometimes it's uh, in the nature of the game that you can't know in advance very much about who your audience might be. But on other occasions, you have a very definite idea. You know if your audience is composed primarily of freshmen or graduate students or professional colleagues uh, or the general public or that most dreaded assignment of all, alumni. <laughs> but the context, both intellectual and you might say atmospheric, what is the subject matter? What's the scale and scope that's appropriate for your presentation in the general framework in which your presentation sits. Who is your audience? How much prior knowledge do they have of your subject matter? Are you introducing them to a topic or carrying them along to an already, uh, further on an already advanced level of understanding? All of these things are absolutely crucial as you begin to think about the uh, particular presentation you're going to make. There is no such thing, I believe, as a generic lecture with the single exception of this one. Uh, all, all lectures need to be tailored to a particular occasion a particular format, a particular audience, and to the uh, extent that you're able to do so, you need to know in advance, before you start preparing your remarks, what is the occasion, what is the context, what is the format, and who is your audience. Now, the second thing, which I suppose uh, comes naturally to all of us as we think about an assignment like this, is the second item noted up here on the outline, is help. Uh, it's perfectly legitimate, indeed I would say uh, virtually mandatory, to ask for help when you're beginning to prepare your remarks. If you're a guest lecturer uh, on some occasion in some foreign institution, or if you're giving a job talk, something I suppose is on the minds of many people in this room, it is highly appropriate for you to ask for help from your host or the person who has invited you to get the feel of the occasion, to ask what is the level of sophistication and interest of your audience. Uh, it's perfectly appropriate to ask your host for 
suggestions about the level of sophistication at which you might pitch your remarks, about the scale of the enterprise that you're undertaking. And again, it's uh, perfectly appropriate in this uh, regard, if you're asked to give a lecture on a subject that uh, perhaps isn't as familiar to you as others, to ask help not only from the person or persons that invited you, but from reference librarians, colleagues, and so on. Uh, this uh, business that we're engaged in in university teaching is by its very nature a collegial enterprise. And if you don't take advantage of the collegial setting in which you're conducting your professional lives, you're letting a major resource go to waste. So do ask for help. Ask for help from the person who puts you into this situation in the first place. Ask for help from librarians. Ask for help from colleagues. Ask for help from your uh, senior colleagues, if that's what the occasion requires. The next item is language. A formal presentation, such as a stand-up lecture like this one, calls, I think, for precise and more or less formal speech. It's not the occasion, by and large, for slang, except used judiciously. And for most of us, an occasion like this is not an appropriate platform to try to achieve flights of Churchillian rhetoric. Few of us are genetically capable of that. Uh, in any case, and to make the effort to usually uh, falls, the effort usually falls flat on its face. The most important thing about language to remember when you're lecturing is to keep in mind that you are giving a speech, not creating a written document. You are trying to conduct, you might say, although there's a certain one-way character to a lecture to be sure, you're trying to hold up your end, you might say, of an intelligent conversation. So the ideal, I think, is to strive for a conversational tone, not to speak ex cathedra or in the Churchillian manner, or to uh, lard your presentation with a lot of throwaway lines uh, laced with slang and popular culture and so on, unless there's a pedagogical reason to do so. But you do, I think, want to strive for an appropriate level of language. There's a premium on precision. Uh, you want to be uh, relatively formal without seeming to be arch. Uh, as I say, the conversational tone, I think, is usually the proper pitch and register uh, in which to cast your remarks. We come next to O for organization. Probably among the very most important elements in any successful oral presentation. You need to prepare in advance. There are those among us who fancy themselves capable of getting up on a moment's notice and delivering in full, fully formed paragraphs, 50 minutes of wisdom on any anointed subject. Uh, there are very few such people among us in reality. And those of us who occasionally pretend that we have that extra genetic endowment that permits us to do such things are fooling ourselves. All the best lectures are the tip of an iceberg of considerable advance preparation. No matter how artfully conversational or how wonderfully spontaneous they might appear, if they are successful, by and large, they are the product of a lot of very serious preparation. Now, in my own case, there's a kind of a process of preparation that I go through, and I will try to describe it for you. First of all, once I've isolated a certain lecture topic, be it a guest lecture at another institution or in a, somebody else's course or an after-dinner speech or an alumni talk or a lecture in a series of lectures of 40 in an undergraduate course or whatever. Once I've identified a particular lecture topic, I then sit down with a piece of yellow lined paper, just to be concrete, and try to make a list of the specific themes that I want the lecture to contain. I try to decide insofar as I can in this preliminary way, what my point of view will be, from what perspective, what avenue of entry will I take into the material, from what perspective will I choose to view it, uh, acknowledging, of course, that there are usually many different ways to look at any given topic uh, in any realm of knowledge, be it history or physics or chemistry or economics or what have you. And I try as best I can, this is probably the single most important part, of the preparatory exercise, I try as best I, as I can at this early stage of thinking about the topic to anticipate my conclusion. The conclusion is, after all, just what it's described, it's described as. A conclusion is the point toward which you're trying to build. 
It is the end point, the end product of the lecture. And it is the single most important destination or work product, you might say, of the lecture exercise. So I try to think of these things early on as I conceptualize the presentation. What are the major themes that should be in it? What will be my principal point of view? And what will be the conclusion that I'm trying to reach? In fact, to, uh, to repeat, as, as best I can, I try to begin at the end. I try to think first of the conclusion. That's the, that's the first most specific and, or specific and concrete thing that I set down on paper generally is what is the conclusion I'm trying to reach. I try to begin my process of thinking at the end of what will eventually be the delivered lecture. Now I also, as a matter of fact, and I'll come back to this in a moment, I also try to end at the beginning when I'm actually making the delivered remarks. And I'll explain in a moment what I mean by beginning at the end when you're preparing and ending at the beginning when you're delivering. And then I undertake an outline, again on the same or a comparable piece of yellow lined paper, of what this uh, lecture will be. What are its basic building blocks? Uh, what are the major themes? What's the point of entry that I will take into the material? What's my destination or conclusion? 